Chapter Seventeen of *The Empty Sack* by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Seventeen. Teddy woke to a brilliant August sunshine, and that calling of marsh birds which is not song. He woke with a start and with terror. He was still on the bench, though turned over on his side and with the pistol in view. He needed a minute to get his wits together, to piece out the meaning of the blackened walls, the sagging floor, and the sunlight streaming through the rent in the roof. A hole that had once been a door, and another that had once been a window, let the summer wind play over his hot face, bringing a soft refreshment. Dragging himself to a sitting posture, his first sensation was one of relief. "'I'm alive!' He hadn't done the thing he had planned last night. Merciful sleep had nailed him to the bench, keeping him motionless, unconscious. The pistol had lain within reach of his hand, and was there still. It could do duty still. But for the moment he was alive. Had he ever asked God for help, or thanked him when it came, he would have gone down on his knees and done it now. But the habit was foreign to the Follett family. He could only thank the purposeless chance, which is the God most of us know best. But he was glad. Twelve hours previously he had not supposed it possible ever to be glad again. It had been a nightmare, he reasoned now, or, if not a nightmare, it had been thought out of focus. He hadn't seen straight and normally. It was as if he had been drunk or mildly insane. He recalled experiences during naval nights ashore, at Brest or Bordeaux or Hampton Roads, when, after a glass or two of something, his mind had taken on this fevered twist in which all life had gone red. Bickley had read this from the lines of his profile. Forehead slightly concave, mouth and chin distinctly convex, tends to act before he thinks. The other traits have been satisfactory, indicating pluck, patience, fidelity, and cheerfulness of outlook. The cheerfulness of outlook asserted itself now. Since he was alive on a glorious summer morning, the two great assets of a man, himself and the outside world, were still at his command. Nevertheless, he didn't blink the facts. "'I'm not a thief, but I took the money. They're after me, and they mustn't get me. I'll shoot myself first, but I don't have to shoot myself yet.' He would not have to shoot himself so long as he was safe, and safety might take many turns. The abandoned, half-burnt sty in which he had found refuge was a fortress in its very loneliness. Close to the road, close to Jersey City, not very far from Pemberton Heights, it had probably no visitor but a toad or a bird or a truant boy from twelve months to twelve months. His chief danger was that of being seen. The door and the window were both on the side toward the road. By avoiding the one and ducking under the other, he could move, but he could move very little. That little, however, would stretch his muscles and relieve the intolerable idleness. The idleness, he knew, would be irksome. By looking at his watch, which had not run down, he found it was six o'clock. The six o'clock stir was also in the air. Motors had begun to dash along the road, and market garden teams were lumbering toward the big town. He was hungry again, but with his seven doughnuts still in the bag, he couldn't starve to death. By getting on the floor he found a peephole just above the level of the grass through which he could see without detection. This must be his spying place. Unlikely as it was that anyone would track him to this lair, he must be carefully on the lookout. What he should do if threatened with a visitor was not very clear to him. There being no exit except by the door, and the door being toward the road from which a visitor would naturally approach, there was no escape on that side. Escape being out of the question, there would only remain the other thing. The other thing was always the great possibility. He hadn't abandoned the thought of it. He had only postponed the necessity. He would live as long as he could, and yet the necessity of the other thing would probably arise. If it arose, he hoped he should get through it by that tendency which he recognised in himself as clearly as Mr. Bickley had read it from his profile, to act before he thought. With this as a possibility, he got down to his peephole, put the pistol near him on the floor, and began on his doughnuts. For breakfast, he allowed himself three, keeping the rest for his midday needs. When darkness fell, he would steal out and buy more. He could do this as long as his money held out, and before it was spent something would probably have happened. What that something would be he did not forecast. 
He was in a fix where forecasting wasn't possible. The minute was the only thing, and a thing that had grown precious. Even the family had somehow become subordinate to that. In the strangeness of his night he seemed to have travelled away from them. A man clinging to a spar on the ocean might have had this sense of remoteness from his dear ones safe on shore. Since they were safe on shore, that would be the main thing. Since his mother and sisters could come and go in Indiana Avenue, he could wish them nothing more. That was the all-essential, and they had it. Want, anxiety, grief, and no Teddy coming home in the evenings, were trifles as compared with this priceless blessing of security. So he settled down amid filth and slime and the debris of charred wood to watch and wait and cling to his life till he could cling to it no longer. Later that morning, Mrs. Collingham motored for Murillo to see Hubert Ray's much-discussed picture, Life and Death, in a famous dealer's gallery in Fifth Avenue. It had hung there a week, and though the season was dead, it was being talked about. Among the few in New York who care for the art of painting, the picture had caught on. The important critics had honoured it with articles in which one wrote black and another white with an equal authority. The important middleman had come in to look at it, saying to one another, "'Here's a fellow who'll go far. En voilà un qui va vers son chemin.' The important connoisseurs had made a point of viewing it with their customary fear of expressing admiration for the work of a native son. From the few who knew, the interest was spreading to the many who didn't know, but were anxious to appear as if they did. Junior's introduction to the picture had caused her some chagrin. She had not ranked Hubert among the important family acquaintances, and when he came down to Collingham Lodge for a night or two, as occasionally he did, she presented him to only the more negligible neighbours. A young man Bob met in France, was all the explanation he required. But in dining out recently she had been led into dinner by a man of unusual enlightenment, with whose flair and discernment she liked to keep abreast. To do this she was accustomed to fall back on such scraps of reviews or art notes as drifted to her through the papers, bringing them out with that knack of putting her best goods in the window, which was part of her social equipment. Books and the theatre being too light for her attention, she was fond of displaying in music and painting the expertise of a patroness. She could not only talk of Boldini and Cezanne, of Paul Duca and Vincent Dundy, but could throw off the names of younger men just coming into view, as if eagerly following their development. Her neighbour's comments on the new picture, Life and Death, at the Carla Gallery, were of value to her chiefly because they were up to date and told her what to say. A reaction against the Cubists and post-impressionists in favour of an art rich in colour, suggestion and significance was a useful phrase, and one easy to remember. But not having caught the painter's name, she felt it something of a shock, when, with the impressiveness of one whose notice confers recognition, her escort went on to remark, "'I'm going to look up this young Hubert Ray and ask him down to Murillo. You and Bradley will be interested in meeting him.' Junior's chagrin was inward, of course, and arose from the fact of having had a budding celebrity like a tame cat about the house, not merely without suspecting it, but without keeping in touch with the thing he was creating. At the same time, she couldn't have been the woman she was, had it not been for the faculty of tuning herself up to any necessary key. Her smile was of the kind that grants no superiority even to a man of unusual enlightenment. "'You can't imagine how interested I am in hearing your opinion of the dear boy's work, "'and so I've been letting you run on. "'He happens to be a very intimate friend of ours. "'He comes down to stay with us every few weeks, "'and I've been watching his development so keenly. "'I really do think that with this picture he'll arrive. "'And to have a man like you agree with me delights me beyond words.' "'It was also the excuse she needed for calling Hubert up. More than two months had passed since her meeting with Jenny, and the twenty-five thousand dollars were still lying to her credit at the bank. She was not unaware of a reason for this, in that Bradley had told her of old Follett's death, and even a bad girl like Jenny must be allowed some leeway for grief. But Follett had been nearly two weeks in his grave, and still the application for the twenty-five thousand didn't come. Unless a pretext could be found for keeping Bob in South America, he would soon be on his way homeward and she, Junior, was growing anxious. 
to be face to face with Hubert would give her the opportunity she was looking for. He met her at the street entrance to the Carla Gallery, conducting her through the main exposition of canvases to a little shrine in the rear. It was truly a shrine, hung in black velvet, and with no lighting but that which fell indirectly on the vivid, vital thing just sprung into consciousness of life, like Aphrodite rising from the sea foam. But, just sprung into consciousness of life, she had been called on at once to contemplate death, eyeing it with a mysterious spiritual courage. The living gleam of flesh, the marble of the throne, and the skull's charnel ugliness, stood out against a blue-green atmosphere like that of some other plain. Junior was startled, not by the power and beauty of this apparition, but by something else. "'You've... you've changed her,' she said, with awed breathlessness, after gazing for three or minutes in silence. "'You mean the model?' She nodded her. "'Yes,' without taking her eyes from the extraordinary vision. "'You've seen her?' he asked, in mild surprise. "'Just once.' Well, the figure is exact, he explained, but I did have to make changes in the features. It wouldn't have done otherwise. No, of course not. More minutes passed in silent contemplation, when she said, I thought there was more of the gleam of the red in amber in the hair. This hair is brown with a little red in it. My God, it as nearly as I could, he felt it enough to say. The shade and sheen and silkiness of hair are always difficult. After more minutes of hushed gazing, Junior made a venture. She spoke in that insinuating, sympathetic tone which in moments of tensity a woman can sometimes take towards a man. "'You're in love with her, aren't you?' He jerked his head in the direction of the nude woman. "'With her? That model? Why, no! What makes you think so?' Junior was disconcerted. "'Oh, only the hints that have seeped through when you didn't think you were giving anything in a way?' He said, with some firmness, "'I never meant to give that away, or to hint that it was, that it was love. A rulers of the studios whom any fellow can pick up.' Junior felt like a person roaming endlessly through sand, who suddenly stumbles on gold. There was more here than, for the moment, she could estimate. All she could see were possibilities. But there was one other point as to which she needed to be sure— it was conceivable that the thing might have been painted long ago, before Bob's departure for South America, in which case he would lose at least some of its value for her purpose. "'When did you do this, Hubert?' "'Oh, just within the last few weeks.' This was enough. With her usual swiftness of decision, she had her plans in mind. "'What are you asking?' He named his price. It was a large one, but her balance at the bank was large. It could be put to this use as well as to another.' "'I'll take it,' she said, after a minute's consideration. "'If you could let me have it within a few days.' Not to betray the eagerness he felt, he said that it would give him publicity to keep it on view as long as possible. "'It will be almost as much publicity to have it on view at Marillo. And in the end he agreed that this was so. He walked back to the studio as if wings on his feet were lifting him above the pavement. It was the seal on his success.' sold to a private collector, would be a bomb to throw among the dealers who had been taking their time and dickering. It was more than the seal on this one success, it was a harbinger of the next success. And with this thing behind him, the next success was calling to him to begin. He already knew what he should begin on. It was to be called Eve Tempting the Serpent. He was not yet sure how he would treat the idea, but a lethargic semi-human reptile was to be roused to the concept of evil by a woman's beauty and abandonment. The thing would be daring, but it couldn't be too daring, or it would bring down on him the recrudescent blue law spirit already so vigorous through the country. He couldn't afford a tussle with that until he was better established. But he had made some sketches, and had written to Jenny that he should like to talk the matter over on that very afternoon. She had written in reply that, at last, she would be free to come. For the first few days after the funeral she had been either too grief-stricken or too busy, but now the claims of life were asserting themselves again, and she was trying to respond to them. He must not expect her to be gay, but she would grow more cheerful in time. So he went back to the studio to lunch, and to wait for her coming. 
Till she had ceased coming, he hadn't known how much the daily expectation of seeing her had meant to him. The very occasions on which she had, as he expressed it, played him false, had brought an excitement which he would have been emotionally poorer for having missed. He could not go through the experience often. He could perhaps not go through it again. But for that test he was apparently not to be called upon. She was coming. She knew what she was coming for. The very fact that she had written meant surrender. And that, indeed, was what Jenny had been saying to herself all through the morning. Now that there had been this interval, she knew that her latitude for saying yes and acting no was at an end. If she went at all, she must go all the way. To go once more and draw back once more would not be playing the game. She was clear in her mind that the day would be decisive. As to her decision, she was not so sure. That is, she was not sure of its wisdom, though sure what she would do. She would do what she meant to do more than two months earlier. There was no reason why she shouldn't, and the same set of reasons why she should. Not only were the money and release imperative, but Hubert meant more to her than ever. His sympathy through her sorrow had touched her by its very novelty. He had written, sent flowers, and kept himself in the background. Bob would have done more, and moved her less, for the reason that doing all and giving all were in his nature. The rare thing being the most precious thing, she treasured the perfunctory phrases in Hubert's scrawl of condolence, above all the outpourings of Bob's heart. Nevertheless, she treasured them with misgivings. The consciousness of being married had acquired some strength from watching the effect of her father's death on her mother. She had known, ever since growing up, that her father and mother had been unequally mated. It was not wholly a question of practical failure or success. It was rather that the balance of moral support had been so shifted between them that the mother had nothing to sustain her. Poor Mamma had been Jenny's way of putting it, has to take the burden of everything. She's got us on her shoulders, and Papa too. And yet, with Josiah's death, some prop of Lizzie's inner life seemed to have been snatched away. She was not weaker, perhaps, but she was more detached and stranger. To her children, to her neighbours, she had always been strange, always detached, but now the aloofness had become more significant. With Josiah alone she had lived in that communion of things shared which leads to understanding. Now that he was gone, something had gone with him leaving Lizzie like an empty house. Jenny was thrown back on what Bob had repeated so often. You're the other half of me, I'm the other half of you. Whether it came through some impulse of affinity, or whether it was the chance of conscientiously living together, Jenny wasn't sure. But it began to seem as if in the mere fact of marriage there was a naturally unifying principle. To go against it was, in a measure, to go against the forces of the universe. And though she had only been nominally married to Bob, she was preparing to go against it. Had she been a rebel at heart, it would have been easier, but she was docile, loving, eager to be loved, with nothing more daring in her soul than the wish to live at peace with the world she saw round her. Bob's letters were disturbing, too. In the way of a happy future, he took everything for granted. He reasoned, as if, now that they had gone through a certain form together and signed it with a parson's name, she had no more liberty of will than a woman in a harem. Little as she was rebellious, she rebelled against that, preferring an element of chance in her love to a love in which there was no choice. Bob wrote as if her love was of no importance, as if he could love enough for two, did in fact love enough for two, so that the whole need of loving was taken off her hands. I feel as if my love was the air and you were a plant to grow in it, it's the sunshine to which your leaves and blossoms will only have to turn. That's all very well for him, she said, falling back with a grimace on the language Gussie brought home with her from vaudeville shows. But I ain't no blooming plant. Hubert's love, she thought at other times, was like a rare and precious cordial, of which a few drops carefully doled out ran like fire through the veins. Bob's was a rushing torrent, which, without saying with your leave or by your leave, carried you away. She preferred the cordial, of which you could take up the glass and put it down according as you wanted, less or more. But on the other hand, 
when there was a flood which, without asking your permission, poured all over you, what were you to do? She knew what she meant to do, but it was the difficulty of doing it and facing that terrific tide which made her stand aghast. If Bob would only let her alone! But then Bob couldn't let her alone. He himself would have argued that you might as well ask a man to let a hand or a foot alone while it is aching. At the minute, when Jenny was thinking these thoughts as she flitted about the house, he was seated at an open hotel window on the Santa Teresa Hill above Rio de Janeiro, looking down on an iridescent city creeping round the foam fringe edges of a turquoise sea, and saying to himself, "'I'm watching over you, Jenny. I'm here, but my love is there and fills all the space between us. I came away and left you exposed to all sorts of trouble. I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry now I did.' I thought that if we were married the rest would take care of itself, but I see now it couldn't. You're having a harder time than I ever supposed you'd have, and you're having it all alone. But my love is with you, Jenny, and the worst can't happen while it protects you. Dangers will threaten you, but you'll go to meet them with my love closing you in, and something will ward them off. I wish you'd stop thinking about me like that. Jenny's reference while she stood at the mirror putting the last touches to her costume, was to this same thought as expressed in the letters she received from South America. Its appeal to her imagination was such as to create an atmosphere wrapping her about as a halo wraps a saint. She couldn't get away from it. In going to meet Hubert, as she would do in a few minutes, it would go with her, an embarrassing witness of the sin against itself. For the minute the action of her mind was twofold. She was making this protest as to Bob, and was also giving minute attention to her dress. But not only was it her first appearance in public since her father's funeral, but it was a moment at which the victim must be neatly decked for the altar. Having no money to spend on mourning, she put deft touches of black on her last year's white summer suit, to which her black hat, thrown together by Gussie, with the black shoes and stockings already in her possession, added to their mute witness that she was grieving for a relative. Having, moreover, the native chic which counts for most in the art of dressing, she was one more instance of the girl of the humbler walks in life, who by some secret of her own confounds the product of the Rue de la Paix. She was to leave for the studio as soon as her mother got up from her early afternoon rest. The early afternoon rest had become a necessity for Lizzie ever since the day when Josiah had been laid away. "'You'll call me if Teddy rings,' she stipulated before lying down, and Jenny had promised faithfully. As to Teddy's message, nominally sent from Patterson, Lizzie had betrayed a scepticism which the three girls found disconcerting. She said nothing, but it was precisely the saying nothing that puzzled them. When they themselves grew expensive with the things they would buy with the money Teddy was going to make, the mother's faint smile was alarming. It was alarming chiefly because it combined with other things to produce that effect of strangeness they had all noticed in her since their father died. Though they couldn't define it for themselves, it was as if she had renounced any further efforts to make life fulfil itself. She was like a man on a sinking ship, who, after casting about as to how he may save himself, knows there is no choice left but to go down, and so becomes resigned. Having thrown up her hands, Lizzie was waiting for the waters to close over her. Jenny was thus uneasy about her mother, as she was uneasy about Bob, uneasy about Hubert, and most of all, uneasy about herself. By the time she was ready, she heard Lizzie stirring in her bedroom. It was the signal agreed upon. She was free to go, which meant that she was free to turn her back on all her more or less sheltered past and strike out toward a terrifying future. She felt as if she had always supposed she would feel on leaving her home on her wedding day, and she would do as she had decided she would do in that event. She would go, without making a fuss, without anything to recall that the going was different from other goings, or that the return would be different from other returns. She would make her departure casual, without consciousness, without admitted attentions. She merely called to her mother, therefore, through the closed door, that she was on her way, and her mother called out in response, very well. This leave-taking making things easier. All Jenny had to do was to gulp back a sob. End of chapter 17
Chapter eighteen of The Empty Sack by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter eighteen. But as Jenny opened the door to let herself out, two men were standing on the cement sidewalk in front of the grass plots, examining the house. They were big, heavily built men, who, although in plain clothes, suggested the guardianship of law. It came to Jenny instantly that their examination of the house was peculiar and of that peculiarity she divined with equal promptness the significance. The men declared afterward that in her manner of standing on the step and waiting till they spoke to her, there was the same kind of giveaway as when her brother had eyed them across Broad Street. The older and heavier of the two advanced up the walk between the grass plots. "'This is the Follies house, ain't it, miss?' Jenny replied that it was. "'And you're Miss Follett? she assented again. "'Is your brother in?' "'No, no, he, he's not in town.' The big man turned toward his taller and slighter colleague, whatever he had to say being communicated by a look. Having expressed this thought, he veered round again toward Jenny, speaking politely. Uh, "'Maybe we could have a word with you, uh, private-like?' "'Won't you step in?' Presently they were all three seated in the living-room, the big man continuing as spokesman. Uh, "'Now, about your brother, Miss Follett, you're sure he isn't anywheres around?' The inference from the tone was that somehow Jenny was secreting him. "'He isn't, to my knowledge. He called up last evening to say that he wouldn't be home today, and perhaps not to-morrow.' The two men being seated within range of each other's eyes, some new understanding was flashed silently. "'Did he, then? And where would he have called from?' "'From Patterson.' "'Oh, from Patterson, was it?' And what made you think it was from Patterson? He said so. And that was all you had to go by? That was all. Well, well, now, he said so, did he? And he didn't come home last night? Jenny shook her head. For a third time Flynn's eyes telegraphed something to Jackman's, and Jackman's responded. What they said to each other Jenny didn't try to surmise, for the reason that she was listening to a call. It was the call that Teddy had heard on the night when his father had brought home the news that he was fired, the call to assume responsibilities. Her father had gone, her mother was collapsing, Teddy had broken beneath the strain. And now it's up to me. Mentally she spoke the words almost before she was conscious of the thought, and that settles it. These words too she spoke mentally, but in them the reference was different. The vision of love and twenty-five thousand dollars, of bliss for herself and relief for the family, which had waxed and waned so often, now faded out forever behind a mass of storm-clouds. But of all this she gave no sign, as she waited for the burly man to speak again. "'And when your brother called up from Patterson, let us say it was Patterson, didn't you ask him no questions at all?' "'He didn't speak to me. I wasn't at home.' It was to my little sister. I understood that he rang off before she could ask him anything. Oh, he did, did he? The telegraphy between the two men was renewed. Uh, didn't he say nothing about what had tucked him to a place like Patterson? I think he said it was business. Business, was it? Oh, well, now. And what sort of business would that be? I don't know. And would you tell me now if you did know? Jenny looked at him with clear, limpid eyes. I'm not sure that I would. I don't know what right you have to ask me questions as it is. This right. Turning back the lapel of his coat, he displayed a badge. Uh, we don't want to frighten you, Miss Follett, my friend and me, we don't. But if you know anything about the boy, it'll be easier in the long run, both for him and for you. What do you want him for? Lizzie's voice was so deep that it startled. On the threshold of the little entry she stood, tall, black, robed, almost unearthly. At the same time, Pansy, who had also come downstairs, crept towards Flynn with a low, vicious growl. Both men stumbled to their feet, awed by something in Lizzie which was more than the majesty of grief. "'Ah, uh, now, we're, we're sorry to disturb you, ma'am, our friend and me. We know you've had trouble, and we wouldn't be for wanting to bring more into a house where there's enough of it already, but, but when things is duty, they can't be put by just because they're unpleasant.' "'Has my son been taking money from Collingham and Law's?' The spectral voice gave force to the directness of the question. Abandoning the hint of professional bullying he had taken towards Jenny, 
Flynn, with Pansy's teeth not sink stitches from his calf, went a pace or two toward the figure in the entry. "'Has he been taking money, that boy of yours? Well, now, and have you any reason to think so, ma'am?' "'None, apart from what I hoped.' Mamma. Jenny sprang to her mother, grasping her by the arm. While Jackman stood like an iron figure in the background, Flynn, always with Pansy's teeth keeping some six inches from his calf, advanced still another pace or two. "'Ah, now that's a queer thing, ma'am, for the mother of a lad to say, that she hoped he was taking money.' "'Oh, don't mind her,' Jenny pleaded. "'She hasn't been just just right ever since my father died.' "'I didn't think of it at first, Lizzie stated in a lifeless voice. "'I believe what he told us, that he was making money on the side. "'It was only latterly that I began to suspect that he wasn't, "'and now I hope he took it from the bank.' "'But good God, ma'am, why? "'Don't you know he'd be caught, and what he'll get for it?' "'Oh, he get that just the same, if you mean suffering and punishment and a life of misery. "'All I want is that he should be the first to strike, "'since he's got to go down before brute power. "'A brute power of law and order, ma'am, if you'll allow me to remind you.' "'She uttered a little joyless laugh. "'Law and order? You'll excuse me for laughing, won't you? "'I've heard so much of them. "'And you're likely to hear a lot more if this is the way of things.' "'Oh, I expect to. They'll do me to death, as they'll do you, and as they do everyone else. Law and order are the golden images set up for us to bow down to and worship as gods, and we get the reward that's always dealt out to those who believe in falsehood.' Flynn appealed to both Jenny and Jackman. "'I never heard no one talk like that, whether dotty or sane.' "'If it was real law and order,' Lizzie continued, with the same passionless intonation, that would be another thing. But it isn't. It's faked law and order. It's a plaster on a saw, meant to hide the ugly thing and not to heal it. It's to keep bad bad by pretending that it's good. Ah, but bad as it is, ma'am, Flynn began to reason, it's better than stealing, now isn't it? But Lizzie seemed ready for him here. I think I've read in your Bible that the commandment, Thou shalt not steal, was given to a people among whom it was a principle that every one should be provided for. If it happened that anybody was not provided for, there was another commandment given as to him, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. He was to be free to take what he needed. Flynn shook his head. Well, that may be in the Bible, ma'am, but it wouldn't stand in a court of law. Of course it wouldn't. And if the court of law is nothing to me, "'It can make itself something to you, ma'am, if you don't mind my saying so. "'Oh, no, it can't. It can try me and sentence me and lock me up, "'but that's no worse than law and order are doing to me and mine every hour of the day.' "'Oh, mamma, Jenny pleaded, clinging to her mother's arm. "'Please stop. Please.' "'I'm only warning him, darling. "'Law and order will bring him to grief as it does everyone else. "'How many did it kill in the war? "'Something like twelve millions, wasn't it?' "'And could anyone ever reckon up the number of aching hearts it's left alive?' "'Yes, Mamma, but that kind of talk doesn't do Teddy any good.' "'It does if we make it plain that he was only acting within his rights. "'These people think that by passing a law they impose a moral duty. "'What nonsense! "'I want my son to be brave enough to strike at such a theory as that. "'It's true that they'll strike back at him, and that they have the power to crush him. "'Only in the long run... He'll be the victor. Flynn looked at Jenny in sympathetic apology. All right now, Miss Follett. Uh, I guess my friend and me'll be going along. You'll do just as you like about that, Lizzie interposed with dignity. But if you see my son before I do, tell him not to be sorry for what he's done, and above all not to think that I blame him. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. When you do, the Eighth Commandment doesn't apply any longer. Jenny followed her visitors to the doorstep. After her mother's reckless talk, they seemed like friends, as indeed at bottom of their kindly hearts they could easily have been. They brought no ill will to their job, only a conviction that if Teddy Follett was a thief, they must get him. Does, does Mr. Collingham know that all this is going on? She asked her question in trepidation, lest these men, trained to ferret out whatever was most hidden, should be able to read her secret. 
It was Jackman who shouldered the duty of answering. He seemed more laconic than his colleague, and more literate. "'We don't trouble Mr. Collingham with trifles, if it was a big thing.' So Jenny was left with that consolation, that it was not a big thing. How big it was she could only guess at, but whatever the magnitude she had no doubt at all but that it was up to her. She got some inspiration from the little word, up. There was a lift in that that made her courageous. Nevertheless, when she returned to the living-room, finding her mother seated, erect and stately, in an armchair, with Pansy gazing at her with eyes of quenchless, infinite devotion, Jenny knew a qualm of fear. "'Oh, Mama, wouldn't it be awful if Teddy had to go to jail?' "'It would be awful or not, just as you took it. If you thought he went to jail as a thief, it would be awful. But if you saw him only as the martyr of a system, you'd be proud to know he was there.' "'Oh, but, Mamma, what's the good of saying things like that?' "'What's the good of letting them throw you down, a quivering bundle of flesh before a juggernaut, and just being meekly thankful? That's what your father and I have always done. And now that the wheels have passed over him, I see the folly of keeping silent. I may not do any good by speaking, but at least I speak. When they muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, it isn't much wonder if the famished beast goes mad.' "'Did you ever see a mad ox, Jenny? Oh, "'That's a terrible sight. "'The most patient and laborious drudge among animals, "'goaded to a desperation in which he's conscious of nothing "'but his wrongs and his strength. "'They generally kill him. "'It's all they can do with him. "'But of course they can do that. "'So that it doesn't do the ox much good to go mad, does it? "'Oh, yes, because he gets out of it. "'That's the only relief for us, Jenny darling, to get out of it. I begin to understand how mothers can so often kill themselves and their children. They don't want to leave anyone they love to endure the sufferings this world inflicts. From these ravings Jenny was summoned by the tinkle of the telephone bell. "'Teddy!' cried the mother, starting to her feet. "'No, it's Mr. Ray. I knew he'd ring me if I didn't turn up.' The instrument was in the entry, and Jenny felt curiously calm and competent as she went towards it. All decisions being taken out of her hands, she no longer had to doubt and calculate. The renunciations, too, were made for her. She was not required to look back, only to go on. In the answer to the question, "'Is this Mrs. Follett's house?' she replied, as if the occasion were an ordinary one. "'Yes, Mr. Ray, I'm sorry I can't come to the studio.' "'Oh, so it's you. You, you can't come. What? Then you didn't come any more?' "'Yes, that's what I thought. I see that now.' that I can't. Well, of all, he broke off in his expostulation to say, Jenny, for God's sake, what's the matter with you? What are you afraid of? I'm not afraid of anything, Mr. Ray, but there's a good deal the matter which I can't explain on the telephone. Do you want me to come over there? No, you couldn't do any good. Is it money? No. She remembered the accumulation of untouched bills and cheques in her glove and handkerchief box upstairs. "'I've got plenty of money. There's nothing you could do, thank you.' There was a pause before he said, "'Then it's all off. Is that what you mean?' "'Isn't it what you meant yourself only a minute ago?' "'Oh, well, you, you needn't stake your life on that.' She began to feel faint. It cost her more to stand there talking than she had supposed it would when she took up the receiver. "'I'm afraid I must, I must take my life on that. I, I can't stay now.' "'I can't come any more to see you, either. "'I've I've given up posing. "'Good-bye.' "'She heard him beginning to protest from the other end. "'No, Jenny, wait, for God's sake!' "'But her putting up of the receiver cut them off from each other. "'So that's all over,' she said to herself, "'turning again into the living-room. "'But she said it strongly, as Lizzie had many a time "'said similar things of witnessing the death of hopes, "'with desolation in the heart, perhaps,' but no wish to cry. Meanwhile, Flynn and Jackman, trudging towards the car station in the square, were discussing this strange case. A funny line of talk about the ox treading out the corn. I never heard nothing like that in our church. But Jackman, being a Methodist and a student of the Bible before coming to New York and giving himself to detective work, was able to explain. That's in the Old Testament to begin with, but Paul takes it up and says that Though it was meant in the first place to apply to the animals, its real application is to man. 
that he that ploweth may plow in hope, and that he that threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. That's the way it runs. That everyone should get a generous living wage, and not be cheated of it in the end, is the way you might put it into our kind of talk. Is it now? And it do seem fair, don't it? For all the old woman yonder is so daft. And would that Paul be the same Saint Paul as we've got in our church? Oh, the very same. Would he now? And you Protestant? That's one thing I've often wondered. Why there had to be so many religions, and every one wasn't a Catholic? But just as easy, him cost us less. Ah, oh, well, it's a queer world, and that poor woman's had a powerful dose of trouble. I don't wonder she's got wheels in her head. Do you? Maybe you and me'd have them if we'd gone through the same. Having thus worked to his appeal, he plunged into it. I know one little woman'd be glad if I was to come home tonight and tell her we'd called the thing off. That's my Tessie. It's amazing how she set her heart on my not tracking down this boy. Not to track him down would be to compound a felony, Jackham replied severely. Oh, well, so it would now. You sure have got the right dope there, Jackman. That I'll tell Tessie. I'll say I'd be compounding a felony, and then words'll scare her for good. So Lynn, too, resigned himself, putting on once more the mask of craft and implacability that was part of his stock in trade, and which Jackman really took off. And all that day Teddy lay crouched in his lair, with his eye glued more or less faithfully to the peephole. Except from hunger he had suffered but little, and the minutes had been too exciting to seem long in going by. It was negative excitement, springing from what didn't happen. But because something might happen, and happen at any instant, it was excitement. From morning to midday, and from midday into the afternoon, cars, carts, and pedestrians travelled in and out of Jersey City, each spelling possible danger. Now and then a man or a vehicle had paused in the road within calling distance of the shanty. For two minutes, for five, or for ten at a time, Teddy lay there wondering as to their intentions, and tried to make up his mind as to his own course. Whether to shoot himself, or make a boat for it. Or, if he shot himself, whether it should be through the temple or the heart, were points as to which he was still undecided. He would get inspiration, he told himself, when the time came. He had often heard that in crises of peril the brain worked quicker than in moments of tranquillity, and perhaps after all a crisis of peril might not lie before him. In a measure he was growing used to his situation as an outlaw. He was growing used to the separation from the family. It was not that he loved them less, but that he had moved on and left them behind. He could think of them now without the longing to cry he had felt yesterday, while the desperation of his plight centred his thought more and more upon himself. If he didn't have to shoot himself, he planned, in as far as plans were possible, to sneak away into the unknown and become a tramp. He couldn't do it yet, because the roads would probably be watched for him. But by and by, when the hunt had become less keen... Seven doughnuts, swallowed without a drop of water, being far from the nourishment to which he was accustomed, he waited with painful eagerness for nightfall. When the primrose-coloured lights up and down the road and along the ragged fringe of the town were deepening to orange, he crept forth cautiously. Even while half-hidden by the sedgy grasses, he felt horribly exposed, and when he emerged into the open highway, the eyes of all the police in New York seemed to spy him through the twilight. Nevertheless, he tramped back towards the dwelling of men, doing his best to hide his face when motor-lights flashed over him too vividly. Unable to think of anything better than to, to return to the friendly woman who had given him seven doughnuts for his six, he found her behind her counter, in company with a wispy little girl. "'Ah, good evening, so's you come back. You found my sandwiches nice.' Terry replied that he had, ordering six with a dozen of her doughnuts. Her manner was so affable that he failed to notice her piercing eyes fixed upon him, nor did he realise how much a young man's aspect can betray after twenty-four hours without water to wash in, as well as without hairbrush or razor. He thought of himself as presenting the same neat appearance as on the previous evening, but the woman saw him otherwise. "'I wonder if I could have a glass of water?' he asked, his throat almost too parched to let the words out. "'But certainly!' She turned to the child, whispering in a foreign language, 
but using more words than the command to fetch a glass of water would require. When the child came back, Teddy swallowed the water in one long gulp. The woman asked him if he would like another glass, to which he replied that he would. More instructions followed, and while the woman tied up the sandwiches, the little girl came back with the second glass. This Teddy drank more slowly, not noticing as he did so that the little girl slipped away. Nor did he notice, as he left the shop and turned westward into the gloaming, that the child was returning from what seemed like a hasty visit to a neighbour's house across the street. Still less did he perceive, when the comforting loneliness of the marshes began once more to close round him, that a big, husky figure was stalking him. It had come out of one of the tenements over the way from the pastry shop, apparently at a summons from the wispy little girl. Like the men whom Jenny had seen eyeing the house in the afternoon, he suggested the guardianship of law, even though he was, so to speak, in undress uniform. His duties for the day being over, he had plainly been taking his ease in slippers, trousers, and shirt. Even now he was bareheaded, putting on his tunic as he went along. He didn't go very far, only to a point at which he could see the boy in front of him turn into the unused path that led to the old shack. Whereupon he nodded to himself and turned back to his evening meal. End of chapter 18「Jenny's chief hesitation was as to cashing the cheques, not because the teller at the Pemberton National Bank didn't know her, but because he did. To present a demand for money made out to Jane Scarborough Follett and signed R. B. Collingham, Jr., was embarrassing.' But she had grown since the previous afternoon, and embarrassment sat on her more lightly. Like Teddy, marooned on the marshes, she seemed to have moved on, leaving her old self behind. Now she had things to do rather than things to think about. One fact was a relief to her. She was no longer under the necessity of betraying Bob. So she cashed her cheques, and counted her money, finding that she had two hundred and forty-five dollars. She didn't know how much Teddy had taken from the bank, possibly more than this, possibly not so much, but whatever the sum, this would go at least part of the way toward meeting it. If she could meet it altogether, then, she argued, the law couldn't touch him. On arriving at the bank, her first sensation was one of confusion. There seemed to be no one in particular to whom to state her errand. Men were busy in variously labelled cages, and more men beyond them sat at desks within pens. Two or three girls moved about with documents in their hands, and there was a distant click of typewriters. People passed in and out of the bank, occupied with their own affairs, and everyone, clerk and client alike, had apparently a definite end in view. It was like coming up against a blank wall of business, leaving no opening through which to slip in. The weakest point seemed to be at a counter beneath the illuminated sign, Statements, where two ladies waited for custom, conversing in the interim. Jenny stood unnoticed while the speaker for the moment finished her narration, bringing it to its conclusion plaintively. So when Mother called in the doctor, it turned out to be a very bad case of typhoid. Statement? The question at the end being directed toward Jenny, the latter asked if she could see Mr. Collingham. The pry was sharp, the tone quite different from that of the domestic anecdote of which she had just heard a portion. Next floor, take the elevator, ask for Miss Ruddick. The voice resumed its plaintiveness. So we had him moved into the corner bedroom and sent for a trained nurse. On getting out of the lift, Jenny found herself in a sort of lobby where applicants for interviews sat with the hang-dog look which such postulants generally wear. A brisk little Jewess, seated at a desk, murmured the name of each newcomer into a telephone, after which there was nothing to do but take a chair and wait upon events. Now and then someone came out from his conference, whereupon a messenger-girl, generally of Slavic or Hebraic type, would summon his successor. It was nearly an hour before Jenny was called to the office of Miss Ruddick, who, with her practised method of dealing with the importunate, prepared to put her rapidly through her paces and land her again at the lift. This Miss Ruddick did, not so much with the minimum of courtesy as with the maximum of conscientiousness. Her aim was to save Jenny's time as well as her own, 
in the altruistic spirit of Mr. Bickley's principles. "'How do you do? Are you the daughter of Mr. Follett, who used to be with us here? So sorry for your loss. There may be a release for him, poor man. We never know, do we? Now what is it I can do for you?' Jenny said again that she hoped to see Mr. Collingham. "'I think you'd better tell your errand to me.' "'I couldn't. I can only tell it to him.' In saying this, she supposed Miss Ruddick would understand the reference to be to Teddy, whose story must by this time be ringing through the bank. In spite of what Jackman had said on the previous afternoon, they couldn't keep so serious a crime secret for more than a matter of hours. But Miss Ruddick only seemed displeased by Jenny's insistence, answering coldly, "'If it's a job you're looking for, the best person to see would be—' And just then the communicating door opened, and Collingham himself came out. He was about to give some order to Miss Ruddick and pass on, when Jenny rose in such a way that his eye fell upon her. When a man's eye fell upon Jenny, his attention was generally arrested. In this case it was the more definitely arrested, for the reason that Jenny, timidly and tremblingly, gave signs of having a request to make. "'You wish to speak to me?' At this condescension Miss Ruddick was amazed. But, the responsibility being taken off her hands, she was already capturing the minutes by being back on her job, according to her favourite expression. Jenny could hardly speak for awe. She recalled what Mrs. Collingham had said, a hard, stern, ruthless man, who kept her, her son, and her daughter as puppets on his string. If he so treated his own flesh and blood, how would he treat her? Following him into the private office, she reminded herself that she must keep her head. She had come on a specific business, and to that business she must confine herself. Her other relations with this terrible man she must leave to his son to deal with. "'Your name is?' His tone was courteous. They were both seated now, he at his desk, she in a small chair, at a respectful distance. The question surprised her, for the reason that in her confusion she supposed that her identity was known to him. "'I'm Jenny Follett.' His visible start did not make her situation easier. She remembered that Mrs. Collingham had said that if he knew of the tie between herself and Bob, he would disinherit him on the spot. Just what was implied by that she didn't understand, but she suggested all that was most dramatic in the movies. To disarm his suspicions in this direction, she hurried on to add, "'I came about my brother.' He relaxed slightly, leaning on the desk and examining her closely. "'Oh, your brother?' "'Yes, sir. I don't know how much money he's been taking from the bank.' Collingham's brows contracted. "'Wait a minute. Has your brother been taking money from the bank?' At the thought that she might be making a false step, Jenny was appalled. "'Oh, don't you know that yet, sir?' "'Don't I know it yet? I, I don't know what you're talking about at all.' So the whole thing had to be explained. Two men had appeared on the previous afternoon in Indiana Avenue, accusing Teddy of systematic robbery. Teddy had so far corroborated the charge that he had absented himself from home and work. He called up once, nominally from Patterson, but the two detectives didn't believe that it was. In any case, she had a little money of her own, her very own, two hundred and forty-five dollars it was, and as far as it would go she had come to make restitution. If it wasn't enough, they would sell the house as soon as they could get it on the market and pay up the balance, if he would only give the order that Teddy shouldn't be sent to jail. Emboldened by his concentration on her story and herself, she took out the roll of bills from her bag, enlarging on her plea. "'You see, sir, it was this way. After my father had to leave the bank last fall, Teddy had to be our chief support, just on his eighteen a week. My two little sisters left school and went to work, but that didn't bring him much.' Then there were the taxes and the mortgages and the expenses of my father's funeral, besides six of us having to eat. You were working too, weren't you? Yes, sir, I was posing, but I only earned six a week. Only? Based on a memory of his own of something Junior had said, a mousy little thing with a veneer of modesty, but mercenary isn't the word for her, there was an implication in this only which escaped Jenny's simplicity. Yes, sir, that was all. Somehow I couldn't get the work. Nobody seemed to want me. He pointed at her roll of bills. Then where did you get the money you're holding in your hand? The question was unexpected and confounding. She must either answer it truly, 
or not answer it at all. If she answered it truly, she not only exposed Bob, but she exposed herself to the utmost rigour of his wrath. She didn't care about herself. She didn't care much about Bob. She cared only about Teddy. The utmost rigour of this man's wrath would send him to jail as easily as she could brush a fly through an open window. She could say nothing. She could only look at him helplessly, with lips parted, eyes shimmering, and the hot colour flooding her face pitiably. It was the kind of situation in which no man with the heart of a man could be hard on any little girl. Besides which, Collingham looked on this silent confession as providential. It would enable him to reason with Bob, if it ever came to that, and tell him what he, the father, knew at first hand and from his own experience. Otherwise he brought no moral judgment to bear on poor Jenny, and contemned her not at all. "'Just wait a minute,' he said in a kindly tone, getting up as he spoke. "'I'll go and straighten the thing out.' Left alone, Jenny had these concluding words to strengthen her. He would straighten the thing out. That meant probably that Teddy wouldn't have to go to jail, and beyond this relief she didn't look. It would be everything. Nothing else would matter. He might be dismissed from the bank. They might starve. But the great thing would be accomplished. It was a half-hour or more before he returned, and when he did he looked worried. Troubled would perhaps be a better word, since even Jenny could see that his thoughts were farther away and deeper down than the incidents on the surface. He spoke almost absent-mindedly. "'I find there's been a leakage for some little time past, and they've had difficulty in fixing where the trouble was. Now I'm sorry to say it looks as if it was your brother. There's hardly any doubt about that.' "'You see, sir,' she pleaded, "'it was so hard for him not to be able to do anything when my father was so ill, and my mother worried, and the bills piling up. They stopped our credit nearly everywhere. And the tax people, they were the worst of all.' "'Yes, yes, I, I quite understand.' and I've told them not to press the matter further. Flynn and Jackman, the two men you saw yesterday, are out for the minute, but when they come in they are to report to me. I don't suppose we can take your brother back, but I'll see what I can do for him elsewhere. He rose to end the interview, so that Jenny rose too. You can keep that money, he added, nodding towards her roll of bills. You were not responsible, and there's no reason at all why you should pay. When Jenny protested, he merely escorted her to the door, which he held open. "'No, don't thank me,' he insisted. "'Please, just make your mind easy as to your brother. The matter shall not go any farther. I don't know what I can do for him as yet. The circumstances make it difficult, but I shall find something.' So, blinded with tears, Jenny made her way towards the lift, calling down on Bob's father as well as on his mother all the blessings that she was able to invoke. Late that afternoon, Teddy, on the floor of his hut, woke with a start from a doze. He hadn't meant to doze, but he had slept little on the preceding night, and was lulled, moreover, by a sense of his security. The day had not been as exciting as the day before. Nothing having happened during all these hours, he was growing convinced that nothing would. In its way, safety was becoming irksome. He began to ask himself whether the spirit of adventure didn't summon him to go forth as a tramp that night. So he dozed, and so he waked with a start. The start was possibly due to a consciousness, even in his sleep, that there were people in the road. He was frightened before he could put his eye again to the peephole. Luckily the pistol was at hand, and the other thing might now have to be done. As a matter of fact, it seemed likely— Two burly figures had already left the highway, Flynn tramping along the flicker of path, and Jackman picking his steps through the oozy mud a little to Flynn's right and a little behind him. There was no secrecy about their approach, and apparently no fear. "'They don't suspect that I've got a gun,' Teddy commented to himself. "'Lobley can't have told them.' They were talking to each other, and though Teddy could not make out their words, he heard Flynn's gurgle of a laugh. To his fevered imagination it was a diabolic laugh, suggestive of handcuffs and torture. The thought of handcuffs frenzied him, of the sacrilegious touch on his person, the lynx set the final mark. Rather than submit to them, he would shoot anyone, preferably himself. 
for shooting himself the minute had come, and he decided to, to do it through the temple. The aim through the heart might miscarry. There was no chance of miscarriage through the brain. All that remained for him now was to know the moment when. Don't shoot till you see the whites of their eyes. Some trick of memory brought the tag back to him. He knew that it applied to the shooting of an enemy, but in this case it suited himself. He couldn't see the whites of their eyes as yet, for through the grasses and over the slimy ground they advanced but slowly. They gave him the longer to live. He might live for three minutes, possibly for five. Even a minute was something. But he was ready. He couldn't say that he had no fear, because he was all fear. But for the very reason that he was all fear, he was frozen, numb. Only the hand that held the pistol shook. He couldn't control it. All the more, then, must he do it through the brain, since he found by experiment that he could steady the muzzle against his temple. He didn't dare so to hold it long, lest that impulse of acting before he thought might deprive him of these last precious seconds of life. So he let the thing rest on the peephole, pointing outward, like a gun on board ship. He found, too, that this steadied his eye. He could squint along the barrel right at the two big figures lumbering through the morass. Don't shoot till you see the whites of their eyes. Flynn looked up, a laugh on his lips at this absurd adventure. The boy saw the whites of his eyes, and as far as he himself knew, his mind went blank. He always declared that he heard no sound. He only saw Flynn throw up his arms with a kind of stifled shout, stagger, try to regain his lost balance, and go tumbling face downward into the long grass. Jackman fell too, though not so prone but that he could partially raise himself, half supported by his left arm, while, without being able to face toward the road, he waved his right to the motors flashing by. For Teddy mind action ceased. He was nothing but mad instinct. He knew he must have fired, must have fired twice, that the hand that was to shoot into his temple had betrayed him. He knew, too, that he couldn't shoot into his own temple. But great as was his terror of the handcuffs, his terror of this thing was worse. Flinging the pistol across the floor, his one impulse was to save himself. As he had foreseen, his mind, once it began to work, worked quickly. He saw that the grass growing up to the door of the shack was tall, and hardly beaten down by his footsteps. Lying flat like a lizard, he wriggled his way into it. The very yielding of the swampy bottom beneath his weight was in his favour. By a sense such as that which had waked him up, he knew that motors were stopping in the road, that people were leaping out, that Flynn and Jackman were the objects of everyone's concern, and that, in the mystery as to what had happened to them, no one's attention was as yet directed to himself. He made for the back of the shack, writhing his way wound the two corners, and heading out toward the centre of the marsh. It was needful to do this, since the shanty in its neighbourhood would soon be explored, and he must, if possible, be lost in the swampy tracklessness. Though progress of necessity was slow, he was amazed at the distance he was putting between himself and danger. Oh, if it was only night! If a thundercloud would only come up and darken the sky! but it was the brilliant, pitiless sunshine of an August afternoon with not a shred of atmosphere to help him. Still, he writhed and writhed and writhed his way onward, making the pace of a snake when half of its body is dead. He was no longer Teddy Follett. He was no longer so much as an animal. He was one big agony of mind which becomes an agony of body. And yet he was eager to live. He began to think that he might live. He seemed as far away from the peril behind him as the woods thing that gives its hunter the slip in the green depths of the covert. Dogs might be able to track him, but not men alone. And while they were bringing up the bloodhounds, he might— And then he heard a shout that struck through him like paralysis. "'There he is. I see him. Where? Where? That line behind the shack. Don't you see a little streak right through the grass? No, I don't see anything. Come along and I'll show you. Come along. Boys, we'll get him. He's only going on his belly.' Yes, and be croaked like this poor guy. Don't forget that the bird over there can give you a dose of lead. So Flynn was dead. That was the meaning of that. Teddy had killed a man. Perhaps he had killed two men. He hadn't taken time to think of it before. But now that he did, he lay stricken in every muscle of his frame, his face in the mud, and his fingers dug into the queechy roots of the sedges. End of chapter 19
Chapter Twenty of The Empty Sack by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Twenty. The guests went early. It was a relief to have them go. Not that they differ from other guests to whom Collingham Lodge was accustomed to open its doors, or that the dinner was less fastidiously good than Junior was in the habit of giving. Dinner and guests had both been up to form and yet it was a relief when the last car glided from beneath the portico. "'Why do you suppose it is?' Junior had asked this question so often of late that Collingham had ceased to try to answer it. Instead, he lit a cigar and strolled to the open French window. He, too, found it a relief to relax in the company of his family, though less puzzled than Junior at the state of mind. "'Oh, come out!' Edith called from the terrace. "'It's heavenly!' It was a soft, warm, velvety night, starlit and voluptuous. The air astir was just enough to carry the scents of roses, honeysuckle, mignonette, and new-mown hay. Except for the darting of small living things and the occasional peep of a half-awake bird, there was no sound but that of the plash of the fountains on the terraces. Edith went in for a light wrap for her mother. Collingham, his cigar in hand, dropped into the teakwood chair. "'It isn't our dinners only,' Junior complained, when, with a wrap about her shoulders, she had settled herself in the wicker armchair she preferred. "'It's all dinners. It's just as if people didn't enjoy them any more.' "'Well, they don't,' Edith half loungingly swung herself and had lost a hammock. "'What we've got to learn, Mother dear, is that entertaining, as we call it, was a pre-war habit which we've outlived in spirit, though we haven't quite come to the point in fact.' "'There's something in that,' Collingham agreed. "'And yet there's got to be hospitality,' Junior reasoned. "'You can't just live and die to yourself.' Edith swung lazily. "'Hospitality, yes, but isn't there a difference between that and entertaining?' "'If so, what is it?' "'I'm not sure that I can say. Isn't the one a permanent necessity, and the other merely a custom that can go out of date?' "'Between your custom that can go out of date and your permanent necessity, "'I don't see that there's much distinction. "'Well, there is, Mother dear. "'It's like this. "'Entertaining is giving people something they don't particularly want "'and which you expect them to repay, "'while hospitality is opening your house to people in need, "'whether they can repay you or not.' "'Oh, if we're going to open our houses to people in need. "'Well, what? "'I'm sure I don't know what. "'Nor you, either.' "'And that's just it. We're halting between two states of mind. "'Ever since the war began, mere entertaining bores us, "'and we're terrified at the idea of genuine hospitality. "'So there we are. We still give dinners and go to them, "'but when we do we feel it's something fatuous "'which can't help making us dull.' "'Out of the silence that ensued, Collingham said moodily, "'It's all very fine to talk of opening your house to people in need, "'but it's not as easy as it looks.' "'Is anything ever as easy as it looks, Dad? "'Don't we shirk the social problems that are upsetting the world "'by declaring them impossible to solve, "'when a material difficulty only puts us on our mettle?' "'He turned this over. "'All that day he had been calculating his own possible responsibility "'in Teddy Follett's going wrong, and was thinking of it now. "'In the end,' he said, "'All the same, you've got to follow the regular trend.' If you were in business, you'd know. You can't do things differently from other people. You may be as sorry as you like not to be able to help, but if you can't, you can't. And there's an end of it. Mr. Ailing, in his new book, Social Problems and the Individual, says there's a distinction to be drawn between can't and can't. There's the can't that comes from lack of ability, and the can't that springs from the accepted standard. He says, I don't believe your father is at all interested in that, Edith, dear. "'Oh, yes, let her go on. I'm not afraid of what Aileen thinks.' But before Edith could resume, the attention of all three was called by the tinkle of the telephone bell in the library, which could be approached from the terrace through the drawing-room. With a muttered, "'Who's ringing up at this time of night?' Collium dragged himself in to answer it. The women remained silent, each listening to see if the call was for her. "'Yes, this is Mr. Collingham. "'Who?' "'Oh, it's you, Mr. Brunt.' "'Yes? What did you say? Killed? Who's killed? 
not Flynn the detective who comes in and out of the bank. Indeed, dear me, dear me, where was it? Who did it? Not that boy. Oh, my God, what happened? Tell me quickly. Over beyond Jersey City, yes, yes, and they've got him. In the brig, that's the Ellenbrook Trail, isn't it? Jackman, too, did you say? Wounded, but not killed. Badly? Oh, the poor fellow. In the hospital? That's right. Has anyone communicated with his family? Good, good. And Flint's wife? Oh, the poor woman. And the boy's family? You don't know anything? That Then no one has informed his mother? Not that you know of. I see. He's to be brought into court tomorrow morning. Poor little devil. Oh, I know he doesn't deserve pity, but... But I can't help it, Brunt. His father was with us so long, and one thing and another. No, I'll appear in court myself and see what I can do for him. Good night. I'll see you in the morning. What boy can that be? Junior whispered as her husband hung the receiver in its place. I'm sure I don't know, unless unless it's the Follett boy. Oh, I hope not. It would make such awful complications. They waited for Collingham to come and tell them his plainly thrilling news but he remained in the library. "'It would make complications,' Edith ventured in a low voice, "'if it proved to be the young Follett, with Bob in love with his sister.' Juno spoke not so much from impasse as from inspiration. "'He's more than in love with her. He's married to her.' "'Mother!' "'Yes, he was married to her a few days before he sailed. I have known it all along.' Edith was breathless. "'Did he tell you?' "'No, she did. "'She? The Follett girl? Why, mother!' "'Junior rose. "'She knew that if her suspicions were correct "'she would have things to do before she slept. "'Go to bed now, dear, "'and I'll come to your room and give you the whole story. "'In the meantime I may have to tell your father.' "'You mean to say that he doesn't know?' "'No, not yet. "'I've been rather hoping that before I told him "'Bob would, would see his way out of the mess.' "'He'll never do that, never in this world, not according to what he said to me.' "'Oh, well, he didn't know everything then that he'll have to know now. "'But go and say good-night to your father, and I'll come up by the time you're in bed.' "'Mother, you're amazing!' Edith spoke more in awe than in aberration, but she obeyed orders by going to her father. She found him still sitting in the chair by the telephone, bowed forward, his elbows on his knees, and his forehead in his hands. When he lifted his haggard eyes towards her, she stood still. "'Daddy, what in the world has happened? Who is it that has killed someone? We couldn't help hearing that much.' He raised himself. "'Come here.' Going forward, she knelt down beside him, taking his hand and kissing it. "'You poor Daddy. You're bothered, aren't you?' "'It's—it's it's young Follett. He's been stealing money from the bank, and—' Now he's shot one of the detectives who heard he was hiding in a cabin out on the New Jersey marshes. <coughs> They've sent out a description of him to the suburban stations, and only today I told his sister that I'd call the thing off and give him another chance. She came to see you? She came to see me. Then you did what you could, didn't you? I did what I could, then. In spite of the emphasis on the final word, he slapped his knee with new conviction. "'I've done what I could all through. It's no use saying I haven't, because I have. There's just so much you can do, and you can't do any more. You can't make a business a home for indigent old gentlemen, now can you?' He sprang to his feet, leaving her kneeling by the chair. "'No, I don't suppose you can,' she assented, rising slowly. "'But I do wish you'd talk to Mr. Ailing some time, Dad.' He seems to see all these things from new points of view. He was pacing around the room, very much like Max, in moments of agitation. Oh, new points of view! There's only one point of view, I tell you, and that's the one on which we've made the country prosperous. She smiled wistfully. Prosperous for some? Well, that's better than prosperous for nobody, isn't it? She said good-bye to him, then, for the reason that she herself was so stirred that she needed seclusion in which to think these strange things over. That Bob should have married Jenny Follett was a shock in itself, but that through his wife he should now be involved in this frightful tragedy was something that her mind found it hard to take in. 
It was the first time that she had ever come so close to the more terrible happenings in life. Meanwhile, Junior, overhearing what was said, reconstructed her plan of campaign. In common with great generals, she possessed the faculty of rapid revision, as events took place differently from the way she had expected. By the time she heard Edith go upstairs, she had foreseen the line of action which the new situation forced on them. Collingham was still lashing about the library when she appeared on the threshold. Her calmness arrested him. In a measure it soothed him. It was the kind of juncture in which he always knew what to do, and he had confidence in her judgment. When she said, "'Sit down, Bradley, I've something to say,' he obeyed her quietly, relighting his cigar. As she, too, sat down, Max or Dauphin would have noted in her the aura of authority which a master wears when about to lecture a schoolboy. "'I've something startling to tell you, Bradley, but I want to say beforehand that you mustn't get worked up, because I see a way out.' Taking his cigar from his lips, he looked at her sidewise. His expression said, "'What's it going to be now?' "'What I've heard you telling Edith about this young follet killing a detective concerns us more closely than you may think, because Bob is married to his sister.' He laid his cigar on an ashtray, swung round to the table between them, clasped his fingers, and leaned on his outstretched elbows. His tone was quiet, even casual. "'When did he do that?' just before he sailed. Then I'm through with him. Oh, no, you're not, Bradley. He's your son, whether he's married anyone or not. I can't help his being my son, but I can help having anything more to do with him. Listen, Bradley, the whole thing is going to be in the papers in the course of two or three days, and you must come through it with honours. It's perfectly simple to do it, and win everyone's respect and a sympathy. In addition to that, you can get Bob's devoted affection." and you know how much that means to us all. To Collingham it meant so much that he listened to her attentively, with eager eyes. In Bob's marriage, with its attendant circumstances, they had obviously received a shock. All Marillo Park, as well as the public in general, would know it to be a shock, and would be watching to see how they took it. In that case, the best thing was the sporting thing. They must stand right up to the facts and accept them. Everyone knew that the younger generation was peculiar. It was the war, Junior supposed, and yet she didn't know. In any case, it was not the Collinghams alone who were so afflicted, but dotted all over Murillo were families whose young ones were acting strangely. There were the Rumseys, whose twin sons had refused an uncle's legacy, amounting to something like three millions, because they held views opposed to the owning of private property. There were the Addingtons, whose son and heir had married a girl twice imprisoned as a red, and was believed to have gone red in her company. Of the Bendingers, whose daughter had eloped with a chauffeur, divorced him, and then gone back and married him again. These were Marillo incidents, and in no case had the parents found any course more original than the antiquated one of discarding and disinheritance. And yet you couldn't wash your hands of your flesh and blood like that. They were your flesh and blood, whatever they did, and it was idiotic to act as if you could cut the tie between yourself and them. He could see for himself that Rumseys, Addingtons, and Bendlingers had lost rather than gained in general esteem by their melodramatic poses. Now the thing for the Collinghams was to accept the situation with a great big generous heart. They were to open their arms to Bob, and back him loyally in the combination of difficulties he had to swing. But he himself must swing them, Junior laid emphasis on that. By direct action they couldn't intervene. They could only make it possible for him to act directly on his own responsibility. He had married a wife whose family was in trouble. They, the Collinghams, would not share that trouble, but they would help him to share it, since he had brought on himself the necessity for doing so. To accomplish this, Junior suggested sending to Bob a cablegram covering the following five points. The Follett boy was in jail, charged with murdering a detective. Bob should publish at once his marriage to this boy's sister. He should return to New York by the first convenient steamer. His father was placing $10,000 in his account, and when that was used would place more. 
he was also ready, if instructed by Bob, to engage the best counsel in New Jersey to defend the boy. "'That will take care of everything till he gets here,' Junior concluded. "'And in the meantime, we can't do better, it seems to me, than go up, as we always do at this time of year, to our camp in the Adirondacks. This house can be kept open for Bob when he arrives, and Gull can stay with one of the motors to run him in and out of town. "'And what are we to do about the girl?' "'Nothing. That isn't for us to take up. We must leave it to Bob. If he ever brings her to us as his wife, but, but then he never may.' "'What makes you think so?' Her superb eyes covered him with her fine, audacious, womanly regard. "'I tell you, Bradley, if, if I didn't think there are things that had better not go into words, even between you and me. Whatever Bob discovers will be his own affair. You and I had best know as little as possible. We can back Bob up, and that's all we can do. Everything else he will have to work out for himself. By the time he's done that, he'll be a grown-up man. It's possible he's needed something of the sort to develop him. So Collingham telephoned his cablegram to Bob, and went to bed comforted. Next morning, on arriving at the bank, he found Junior's counsel supported by the best opinion among his co-workers. That is, he changed his mind as to going to the court in Edinburgh for the first hearing of the Follett boy, or otherwise expressing himself toward the Follett family. He had given Bob the means of doing whatever needed to be done, and Bob had the cable at his disposition. To go to the court, or to express sympathy in any way, would, according to Bickley, be dangerous to discipline. Feeling in the bank was extremely hostile to young Follett, and it was better that it should remain so. The bank employee's cast of mind, so Bickley said, was not revolutionary or rebellious against acknowledged rights. By sheer force of habit it was schooled to reverence for life and property. The principle of ownership being holier to it than any tenet of religion, the Follett boy would not be looked upon otherwise than as an enemy of mankind, and this was as it should be. While Collingham thus weighed the counsels offered him at the bank, Gussie Follett was blindly making her way homeward from Corinne's, with a paper so folded in her hand as not to display its headlines. She had gone to work with comparative cheerfulness, since, on the previous day, Jenny had been assured by no less authority than Mr. Collingham himself that Teddy should not be sent to jail. So long as he was not sent to jail, they would be free from public comment, and, free from public comment, they could manage somehow. Managing somehow, being an art in which they had gained authority, they were not afraid of that, even though it involved parting with the one great asset against calamity, the house. Gussie's first intimation of bad news came when, on entering the shop, she found the four or five other girls huddling round Corinne. Her appearance made them start as if she were a ghost. Her own heart sank at that, though she hailed this shudder with a laugh. "'Say, girls, is this the big reel in the Spectre Bride?' Corin, whose real name was Mamie Callaghan, emerged from a miniature forest of upright metal rods crowned with hats at various roguish andals. A dark, wavy-nosed woman of cajoling Irish witchery, she could hardly keep the prank from her voice even at such time as this. "'So, Gussie, you don't know. Well, someone's got to break it to you, and I guess it'll have to be me.' but it was broken already, even before Corin had brought forward the paper she was hiding behind her back. "'Teddy!' Gussie cried out. "'There's something about him in that. Let me see it! Let me see it!' Corin let her see it, and the work was done. Gussie couldn't read beyond the headlines with their robbery and murder in italic capitals, but she grasped enough. A snapshot of Teddy taken on the road— just as he had been dragged a mass of slime out of the morass, made her reel backward as if about to fall. But when Eileen O'Brien sprang to her support, she waved her away gently. She was not going to faint. Her physical strength wouldn't leave her, whatever else was gone. "'I'm, I'm going home,' was all she said, crushing the paper against her breast. "'Oh, Gus, let me go with you,' Eileen had begged. But this kindness, too, Gussie put away from her. She could go alone, and alone she went, with one consuming thought as she sped along. 
Oh, Mama, poor Mama, this will about finish her. And yet, when she entered the living room, her mother was sitting, calm and serene, while Mr. Brunt told the tale of the New Jersey marshes. Jenny, white, tearless, terrified, crept up to Gussie, and the two clung together as her mother said in her steady voice, "'So I understand that only one of them is dead, the Irish one,' Mr. Brunter said in, "'Yes, Flynn, the Irish one.' "'I am not surprised. I told him when he was here the other day that what he called law and order would bring him to grief, as they bring most of us, though I didn't expect it to be so soon. "'And my son, you say, is in jail?' "'At Ellenbrook. "'They'll try him, I suppose.' "'I'm afraid so. "'And then they'll send him to the chair.' "'Mr. Brunt didn't answer. "'Oh, you needn't be afraid to speak of it. "'I know they will. "'I'm not sorry. "'Teddy will be sorry, of course, till it's over. "'But I'd rather he'd suffered a little now and be done with it "'than go through the hell of years his father and I have had.' If there was going to be any chance for him, it would be different, but there's no chance, not the way the world is organised now. The girls crept forward together. Mama, darling. But Lizzie resumed calmly. Where there's nothing but government by the strong for the strong, people like ourselves must go under. You'll go under too, Mr. Brunt. You belong to the doomed class. The working man will soon be getting share and share alike with the capitalist, and the white-collar crowd will be kicked about by both. If we have the pluck to fight as the working man has fought, we might save something even now. But we haven't, and so there's no hope for us. Law and order have us by the throat, and we must suffer till they strangle us. Well, my boy will soon be out of it, thank God, and all I ask is to follow him. When Mr. Brunt got himself to the door, Jenny went with him, as she had done with Flynn and Jackman two days earlier. She did this in the dazed condition of a woman who performs some little act of courtesy during shipwreck, or waiting for the vessel to go down. "'You must excuse my mother, Mr. Brunt. Ever since my father died her mind's been unsettled, and we don't know what to make of her.' But Mr. Brunt's demeanour did not encourage conversation. To do him justice, the mission on which Collingham had sent him had been repugnant for other reasons than the breaking of bad news. His mind, being of the cast Bickley had analysed that morning, Teddy's theft filled him with more horror than his killing of a man. To come so near to crime against the ownership of banknotes inspired him with a physical loathing which even dear Jenny's loveliness couldn't mitigate. It was as if she herself was tainted by some horrible infection making it a relief to him to get away from her. But, turning to re-enter the house, she felt again that access of new strength which had come to her repeatedly during the past few days. It was as if resources of hers, never been taxed before, were now offering themselves for use. What she had to do was in the forefront of her thought, rather than what someone else had done. What someone else had done was already in the past. That was made for her, and couldn't be helped whereas her own duties imperatively summoned her to look ahead. "'Teddy will need a suitcase of clean things,' was the direct expression of these thoughts, before she had recrossed the threshold. Having said this aloud to Gussie, Gussie's mind could also tackle the minor, concrete details to the exclusion of the bigger considerations involved in Teddy's plight. That the honest, loving, skylarking boy whom they'd grown up with could be a thief and a murderer, was something the intelligence rejected, as it rejected dreams. They could, therefore, take the new straw suitcase which had once been a family present to Gussie, and which she had never used, pack it with Teddy's other suit and the necessary linen, as if he were really at Patterson or Philadelphia. "'How shall we get it to him?' Gussie asked, when the work was done. "'I'll take it,' Jenny answered, "'if you'll stay and look after Mamma." Mama won't need much looking after, the way she is. Well, that's one comfort, anyhow. With this to go through with, I'm glad her mind's not what it used to be. So, stunned and dry-eyed, they caught on to the new conditions by doing little perfunctory things, consoling and helping each other. End of chapter 20
Chapter Twenty One of The Empty Sack by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Twenty One. Teddy's first night in a cell was more tolerable than it might have been, for the reason that his faculties seemed to have stopped working. As nearly as possible, he had become an inanimate thing, to be struck, pulled, hustled, and chucked wherever they chose. Not only had he no volition but little or no sensation. A dead body or a sack of flour could hardly have been more lost to a sense of rebellion or indignity. It was not that he didn't suffer, but that suffering had reached the extreme beyond which it made no further impression. Nothing registered any more, no horror, no brutalities, no curses or kicks. As far as he could take account of himself, the Teddy Follett, even of the shack, had been left behind in some vanished world, while the thing that had hands and feet was a clod unable to resent the oaths and blows and flingings to and fro which were all it deserved. Once he had heard that shout, I see him, in the road, he had been like an insect paralysed by terror that doesn't dare to move. He had lain there till they came and got him. It was not fear alone that pinned him to the spot. His bodily strength had given out. For forty-eight hours he had eaten but little, and drunk only the two glasses of water in the pastry shop. Though he had slept the first night, the second had been passed in a fevered, intermittent doze. Furthermore, the agony of approaching suicide had drained his natural forces. So he lay still, while the hue and cry of the man-hunters quickened and waxed behind him. Escape was out of the question, since even if he had the strength to drag himself a few yards farther, they would run him down in the end. Resistance, too, would be hopeless, with, as he judged, some twenty or thirty in the posse. He could feel their fury growing as they slipped and slithered through the grasses. Oaths, obscenities, and laughter accompanied every grotesque accident, as one man fell with the weedy tangle about his feet, or another went knee-deep into the swamp. The very fear of a dose of lead intensified their excitement, till, as they caught sight of him, a helpless thing with face hidden in the mud, they gave vent to a yell of satisfaction. They didn't let him rise. They didn't so much as pull him to his feet. They dragged him by his collar, by his hair, by his arms, by his legs, by anything they could seize, kicking, beating, and cursing him. He made no outcry. He didn't speak a word. For all they knew, he might be drunk, or insane, or dead. Only once, when a man kicked him in the face, was he powerless to suppress a groan. Otherwise, he was just a sodden lump of flesh, as, now head first, now feet first, now with face upward, now with face downward, he was tugged and tumbled and hurtled and rolled over the five hundred yards of slime between the spot where they had caught him and the road. There he had a new experience. He learned what it was not only to be outside the human race, but to be held as its foe. Already, while still far out on the marsh, he had heard the yells, "'Kill him! Kill him! Kick the damned skunk to death!' But when actually surrounded by these howling, screaming, outraged citizens, with their teams and motor-cars banked on the roadway, he tasted the peculiar astonishment of the man who has always been liked when assailed by a storm of hatred. While the three or four police who by this time had appeared did their best to defend him, men fought with one another to get at him. A well-dressed girl of not more than eighteen reached over the shoulder of one of the police and struck him on the head with her sunshade. An elderly woman squeezed herself near him and spat in his face. "'Ah, say, people,' one of the police called out, "'give the young guy a chance. Can't you see he's only a kid?' "'Kid be damned,' came the response. "'Say, fellows, here's the telegraph pole. Let's lynch him.' "'Lynch him, lynch him, string him up.' "'No, let's make a bonfire and burn him alive.' "'Chop the cops into the hack and sack, and then we can do as we like. "'Lynch him, lynch him, lynch him!' Teddy didn't care whether they lynched him or not. And as far as he could form a wish, he wished they would. But then he was past forming wishes. They could string him up to the telegraph pole, or burn him alive just as they felt inclined, for he had travelled beyond fear. Just then the crowd parted, the police van drove up, and his protectors dragged him to its shelter. Even then there was a new sensation in store for him. The party of the crowd showed Flynn lying by the roadside, also waiting for the van. He was on his back, his knees drawn up, his mouth dropped open. Waistcoat and shirt had been torn apart, and Teddy saw a red spot. 
he started back. Except for the groan when he had been kicked in the face, it was the only time he opened his lips. "'I didn't do that!' he cried, so loud that a jeer broke from the crowd. A policeman shook him by the arm. "'Say, Sonny, you didn't do that!' Appalled by the sight of the dead man, Teddy could do nothing more than stupidly shake his head. "'Then who in hell did? Tell us that!' But the boy collapsed, his head sagging, his knees giving way under him. When he returned to consciousness, he was lying in the dark, jolting, 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 on the floor of the police van. At the station he was pulled out again. He could stand now and walk, though not very well. Hans supported him as he stumbled up the steps, and into a room where a man in uniform sat behind a desk, while three or four police and half a dozen unexplained hangers-on stood about idly. A live one, the policeman who led Teddy called out jocosely as they approached the door. Looks like a dead one, the man behind the desk replied, with the same sense of humour. Looks like he's been dead and buried and dug up again. The allusion to Head Teddy's hatless, mud-caked appearance raised a laugh. The man behind the desk dipped his pen in the ink bottle and drew up a big ledger. Name? Teddy could just articulate. Edward Scarborough Follett. Gee whiz, guess you'll have to spread it out. Teddy spelled slowly, as if the letters were new to him. Having done this, he was asked no more questions. Explanations came from the officer who had run him in, and who produced the automatic pistol picked up on the floor of the shack. When it was stated in addition that Teddy was charged with shooting and killing Peter Flynn, whom all of them knew, and to whom they were bound by ties of professional solidarity, the boy felt the half-friendly indifference with which the spectators had seen him come in, changed to sullen hostility. The formula was fulfilled. He was seized more roughly than before, to be half-led, half-pushed, along a dim hall and down a dimmer flight of steps to a worn, stone-flagged basement pervaded by dankness and a smell of disinfectants. The corridor into which they turned was long and straight and narrow, like a knife cut through a cheese. On the left, a blank stone wall was the blanker for its whitewash, on the right, a row of little doors diminished down the vista to the size of pigeon-holes. Pressed close to the square foot of grating inset in each door was a human face, eager to see who was coming next, while the officer was greeted with howls of rage or whining petitions or strings of ugly words. They stopped at the first open door, and after one glance within, Teddy started back. "'Don't put me in there, for Jesus' sake!' The cry was involuntary since he knew he would be put in there in any case. "'Ah, go in with you!' A shove sent him over the threshold with such force that he fell on the wooden bunk which was all the dog-hole contained, while the door clanged behind him. All that night he lay in a stupor induced by misery. No one came near him. No food or drink was offered him. Thirst made him slightly delirious, which was a relief. Now and then, when his real consciousness partially returned, he muttered, half aloud, "'I didn't do it. My hand might have done it, but that wasn't me.' The crepuscular light of morning was not very different from the darkness of night, but it brought his senses back to him sluggishly. Bruised as he was in body, he was still more bruised in mind, and could render to himself no more than a vague account of what had happened yesterday. When a tin of water and a hunk of bread were mysteriously pushed into the cell, he consumed them like an animal, lying down again on the bunk. Without water for a wash, his face and hair were still caked with the mud, which also stiffened his clothing. "'My God, what's that?' Not having seen him before, the guard who summoned him to court was startled by the apparition that crawled to the threshold of the cell when the door was unlocked. The semblance to a boy was little more exact that of a snowman to a man. "'Oh, my God, my God, sure you can't go into court like that. They wouldn't know you was a human being, let alone a prisoner. Wait a bit, I'll get you something to wash you up in.' There followed a little rough kindliness, scouring and brushing and combing the lad into something less like a monstrosity. Teddy submitted as a child does, and with a child's indifference to cleanliness. So, too, he submitted in court, hardly knowing where he was, or the significance of these formalities. Apart from the relief he got from his own reiterations, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. The proceedings were a blur to him. When he was led out again down more steps, along more corridors, 
and cast into another stale and disinfected cell, he took it with the same brutish insensibility. He didn't know that the new cell was in that part of the house of detention known as Murderer's Row, nor did he heed the hoarse questions whispered through the next-door grating, and which he could barely catch as they stood along the wall. "'Say, hey, what you do in? Did he croak right off? My cry didn't croak till three weeks after I gave him the lead, and I they can't send me to the chair now how. He'd luck, ain't I?' To Teddy this uncanny recitation was no more than the other sounds which smote the auditory nerve but hardly penetrated to the brain. They were all abnormal sounds, sprung of abnormal conditions, breaking in on a silence which was otherwise that of the sepulchre. Footsteps clanked, and then all was still. A door banged, and then all was still. A raucous voice shouted out a curse, and then all was still. The stillness was as ghostly as the sound, only that, as far as Teddy was concerned, so little reached his massacred perceptions. The rattle of keys and the clanging of the door. He looked up from the bunk on the edge of which he was sitting listlessly. "'Lady to see you!' This guard was young, smart, debonair, with a twinkle in his eye, and the first who didn't treat a comrade's murderer with instinctive animosity. Teddy got up and followed him in the stupefied bewilderment with which he had done everything else that day. "'Lady to see him?' The words seemed to refer to something so far back in his history that he could hardly recall what it was. Once upon a time there had been a mother, a Jenny, a Gussie, and a Gladys, but now they were remote and shadowy. Along corridors, up steps, and then along more corridors he tramped, till they stopped at an open door, and there he saw Jenny, in a room unspeakably bare and forbidding in spite of a table and half a dozen chairs, she waited for him with a smile. He, too, did his best to smile, but his lower lips, swollen with a kick that had caught him in the mouth, made the effort nothing but a rictus. For this, Jenny had been prepared by the snapshot in the paper. All the while she had been on the way to him, she had been saying to herself that she must show no sign of horror or surprise. Even though she would follow the cue of her poor demented mother and pretend that he was in prison as a martyr, she would take no pitying or tragic note. She went forward, therefore, and threw her arms about him with the same off-hand, unsentimental pleasure which she would have shown in meeting him after a brief absence at any time. "'You darling Ted, we're so glad to have found you. I thought I'd just run down and bring you some clean clothes.' It was better done than she thought she had the strength for, perhaps because his need was greater than she had supposed possible. Could she have dreamt beforehand that Teddy would ever look like this? she would have screamed from fright. But now that he did, she rose to the fact, seemingly taking it for granted, actually taking it for granted, through some hitherto unsuspected histrionic force. Within a minute of his arrival they were seated near each other, in a curious make-believe that the conditions were not terrible. With this familiar presence beside him, Teddy's mind resumed functioning, possibly to his regret. Home was close to him again, while the loved faces came back to life. "'How's Ma?' The question was indistinct, because, now that it came to making conversation, he found that his tongue was thickened in addition to his swollen lip. Jenny replied that her mother's health was never better. "'I suppose,' he balked a little, but forced himself onward, "'I suppose she feels pretty bad over me.' "'No, she doesn't. She told me to tell you so.' She was determined to speak truthfully in this respect, so that if their mother's dementia could do him any good, he shouldn't fail of it. She told me to say that you were not to be sorry for anything you'd done, no matter how they punished you. Does she, does she know what I've done? She threw it off as if casually. She knows all that's been in the papers, and I don't believe they've left anything out, not judging by the things they've said. How's Gussie? How's Gladys? Having answered these questions to the best of her ability, Jenny raised the subject of what she should bring him to eat. The guard, who had remained in the room, informed her that she could bring him anything, and which she promised to return next day. For the minute she was at the end of her forces. If she went on much longer, they would snap. "'I'll run away now, Ted,' she said, rising. "'It's splendid to see you so bucked up. I'll be here again about this time tomorrow, and bring you something nice.' 
Mamma's busy already making you a fruit cake, she added, as she held him by the hand. I suppose you'll have to have a lawyer. A memory came to him like that of something heard while under an anaesthetic. I think the judge said this morning that he'd appoint someone to, to defend me. Oh, we'll do better than that, she smiled cheerily. I've got some money. We'll have a lawyer of our own. The journey home was the hardest thing Jenny had ever had to face. Teddy, Teddy, Teddy brought to this. It was all she could say to herself. The bare facts dwarfed all its causes, immediate or remote. Eager for privacy in which to sob, she was speeding along Indiana Avenue when, happening to glance in the direction of her home, she saw Gladys standing on the sidewalk. Gladys, having at the same minute perceived her, started with a violent bound in her direction. She, too, had a newspaper in her hand, leading Jenny to expect a repetition of Gussie's episode that morning. It was such a repetition, and it was not. It was to the extent that Gladys had been informed of Teddy's drama, much as her elder sister at Corinne's, though later in the day. At a minute when trade was slack and Gladys ruminantly chewing gum, Miss Hattie Bellwether, a cash girl in the gloves, slipped up to her to say, "'Oh, Gladys Follett, if you knew what Sunshine Bright had been saying about you, you'd never speak to her again!' Hattie Bellwether, who had the blank, innocent expression of a sheep, having paused for the natural inquiry, went on breathlessly, "'She says your brother Teddy robbed a bank and killed a man and is in jail over at Edinburgh, and—' Such foolish calumny Gladys could so far contemn as to say with quiet force, "'You tell Sunshine Bright that the next time I go by the nations I'll stop and break her neck. See?' Hattie Bellwether, having sped away to carry this challenge, Gladys found herself confronted by Miss Flossie Grimm, a sales lady in the stockings, to which department Gladys herself, in a minor capacity, was also attached. Feeling that the Follett child was ignorant of facts of which she should be in possession, Miss Grimm said reprovingly, "'You've got a chunk of gall. Look at that!' That was one of the papers giving the story of Teddy's downfall, so that Daddy's too was soon making her way homeward. But she was not a cash girl for nothing, while the instincts of the city gamine endowed her with alertness of mind beyond either of her sisters. She remembered that the paper she had seen was a morning one, and that by this hour those of the afternoon would be on the newsstands. They would not only give further details, but might possibly tell her that the whole story was untrue. Somewhere she had heard that among the New York evening papers one was renowned for solemnity and exactitude. Veracity, costing a cent more than she usually spent for the evening news, when she spent anything, which was rare, she felt the occasion worth the extravagance. In these pages Teddy's case was condensed into so small a paragraph that she had difficulty in finding it. But during the search she lighted on something else. It was something so extraordinary, so unbelievable, so impossible to assimilate, as to thrust even Teddy's situation well into the second place. After that, all the known methods of locomotion were slow to Gladys in their efforts to reach home. But before she could enter the house, she had seen Jenny advancing up the avenue, and so ran back to meet her. "'Oh, Jen, look!' It was all she had breath to say, so that Jenny naturally did as she was bidden. But she, too, found the paragraph thrust beneath her eyes extraordinary, unbelievable, and impossible to assimilate, though for other reasons than those that swayed her sister. Collingham, Follett, on May the 11th, at St. Titus's Rectory, Madison Avenue, by the Reverend Leonard Goodbody, Robert Bradley Collingham, Jr., of Murillo Park, New York, to Jane Scarborough Follett, of Pemberton Heights, New Jersey. Of the many things Jenny didn't comprehend, she comprehended this paragraph least of all. Who had put it in the paper, and what did it mean? She walked on dreamily, Gladys trotting beside her a living interrogation point. Oh, Jem, what's it all about? Are you married to him, really? Jenny answered as best she knew how. Not, not exactly. But here Gladys was too quick for her. "'If you're married to him at all, it's got to be exactly, hasn't it? "'I, I, I did go through, through the ceremony.' "'Well, then, you've got the law on him,' Gladys declared earnestly. "'He'll have to pay you alimony, anyhow.' "'I, I don't want him to pay me anything.' 
not pay you anything, and him with a wad as big as a haystack. Oh, Jen, you're not going dippy like poor Mamma, are you? Jenny wondered if she was. It seemed to her as if she could stand little more in the line of revolution without her mind giving way. And yet, within a few minutes, she received another shock. It came through Gussie, who ran to meet her at the door. "'For mercy's sake, Jim, what's all this about?' She fluttered a yellow envelope, on which the address was typewritten. "'Mrs. Bradley Collingham, Jr. Care of Mrs. Follett, 11 Indiana Avenue, Pemberton Heights, New Jersey.' "'I told the boy it didn't belong here.' Gussie was beginning to explain when Gladys interrupted. "'Yes, it does. Read that.' Gussie read and read again. "'Well, of all—' She stopped, only because she lacked the words with which to continue. In the meanwhile, Jenny had opened a telegram and read, "'Have asked father to engage best counsel in New York to defend boy. Sailing tomorrow on Venezuela, and will take all responsibilities off your hands.' Place two thousand dollars to your account at Pemberton National Bank. See manager. Devoted love, your husband, Bob. Jenny let the yellow slip flutter to the entry floor while she stood gazing into the air. Gussie, having picked it up, the two younger sisters read it together. Some class, Gladys commented dryly. But Gussie could only stare at Jenny awesomely, as if a miracle had transformed her. End of chapter 21